The development of British Columbia as an industrial province is a great story of man's achievements against the forces of nature. It began when British Columbia was an unsettled wilderness of rock and forest, studded with emerald lakes, scored with the courses of rampant waters, up and brutal land that held out with all its forces against the inevitable invasion of man. First of these invaders was Sir Alexander Mackenzie, whose venture through their granite wilderness to the Pacific Ocean is an epic of Canadian history. And later came the adventurers, lured on by the lust for easy gold in the caribou. Many succeeded, while countless others were driven back. But news of wealth more lasting than gold gradually carried to the outside world, and hardy pioneers crossed along the rugged coastline in a thousand inlets from Alaska to the Straits of Juan de Fuca. Fishing fleets add their shimmering contribution to the wealth of the province. And deep in the heart of mountains, where minerals lie in hiding, BC miners blast still other treasures from the rock. Nor must we overlook the men of the soil, pioneers and sons of pioneers, who have sunk their plows in the yielding earth, rolling back the brush and swamps of stubborn valleys to reap still another great reward. And so it has been that in less than a century, these four basic industries have developed from humble beginnings to become the economic mainstay of British Columbia. An economy based on the natural wealth of the land and upon the pioneer spirit of its people. With this progress through the years, cities grew and people came, attracted from other parts of the world to this young and vital West. With this growth came the development of other industries to serve and maintain the growing civilization. Industries to manufacture finished products from the basic materials of the earth. And the new industry needed power. So man again harnessed nature. And early in the century, and as it turned the wheels of industry at an ever-increasing speed, far-sighted governmental leaders came to focus the best water reserves in the unsettled areas far in the hinterlands and to recognize the possibilities of these reserves as the nucleus of other great manufacturing centers. As early as the 20s, surveys were started to determine the extent of this water power. A program got underway to induce manufacturers to the province. But manufacturers who need great water power resources were not easily found. So time passed. Circumstance intervened. The waters of the hinterland continued their wasteful course to the sea. But faith of mankind is enduring. Behind gray stone walls in Victoria, there still clung the dogged conviction that somewhere, somehow, there must be found a use for this power. The search continued with the years. And a time came when information was forwarded to the Aluminum Company of Canada soliciting the company's interest in British Columbia. This was received with interest, but the company was starting construction of the Great Shipshaw Plant in Quebec, a project that promised adequate power for aluminum needs at that time. As yet the world had not accepted aluminum at its full worth, but that acceptance came all too suddenly. With an emergent demand, on all the free nations of the world, war, and with it, the demand for aluminum. The vast production resources of the company in eastern Canada were thrown into the struggle. Plants at Arvida, Ilmalin, Latouk, Boharnois, and Shawinigan Falls were geared up to 24-hour operation in turning out the products of conflict. Other plants at Kingston, Etobicoke, Wakefield, and Toronto likewise were pressed to capacity and Canadian aluminum made its own important contribution to final victory. During the emergency, the company had devised methods of reducing production costs. And as peace returned, there came from the war-torn world an increased demand for the products of reconstruction. Among them, aluminum in all its forms, electrical equipment, household utensils, building materials, created such a demand for ingot production that the company was obliged to look forward again. Expansion was indicated, but where exactly? Canada, South America, Africa, New Zealand, or Borneo? 
It would seem that destiny must have prompted a second approach by the British Columbia government to the aluminum company at that specific time. For negotiations developed quickly, and the government sent Mr. Kenny, Minister of Land, and his deputy, Mr. George Melrose, to make a personal inspection of what the company had accomplished in the province of Quebec. In the course of their trip, they visited the model town site and the great planted Arvida and studied the manufacture of aluminum. With keen interest, they viewed the clean, modern community of friendly, happy people. Here was the home of an industry, demonstrating beyond doubt its responsibility and capacity for healthy progress. Here was space for gracious living. They toured the company docks at Port Alfred, stirred by information that the port handles an aggregate annual total of over two and a half million tons. They examined the company's power development along the Saguenay. Two million horsepower, harnessed for aluminum production. Here was major industry. To the two Westerners, 40 long years of search for such an industry seemed to climax at this moment. This was their time for action, and action followed. In the spring of 1948, Alcan representatives, on invitation of the government, visited British Columbia, and what they saw and heard here impressed them. They needed tremendous water power. They needed a sheltered harbor with access to shipping routes. They needed a town site for 50,000 people. Above all, they needed a cooperative government and a sympathetic people. British Columbia gave promise of all. It was subsequently agreed that the company would spend a million dollars in a survey of the wild areas of northern BC. Please. But these men were not sightseeing. They were, in essence, pioneering a new industry. This was a preliminary examination covering two prospective areas. The first one known as the Chilco area centers about a point 150 miles due north of the capital city of Victoria. This was duly examined and passed up for various reasons. The second, about 350 miles north of Victoria, is called the Nechaco Kitimat area. In close-up, we get some idea of this area and of the lake chains which flow easterly into the Nechaco River, also an impression of the rugged nature of the Pacific coastline. Studying these areas reassured Alcan engineers that government reports were accurate. Besides finding water reserves adequate for efficient aluminum production, a suitable plant site was located at Tidewater. The prospect looked good. More detailed examination was conducted during the summer along the inland water courses. Once again, survey data provided by the BC Government Department of Land proved extremely helpful. At Kitimat, engineers found the forsaken wilderness. For well, these men had prospected before, this was nothing new. One thing was certain, adequate space for a plant site with wharf facilities and a town site were there. And these men knew that what had been done before in a quiet valley in Quebec could be done again in the wasteland of the Kitimat. On the strength of this early examination, Alcan set up survey offices in Vancouver. Contracts were let to the BC International Engineering Company for general engineering and to other British Columbia companies for field work, transportation and other services. And in June of 1949, the field survey got underway. The watershed area is a glacial plain, generally level, but rising sharply to high mountain crests at the western end. Two main lake chains converge into the Nechaco River, draining them eastward. The general proposals for development may be easily followed. By damming the Nechaco near its source, these lake basins would fill in time to form a continuous reservoir, as shown in the darkened areas. Now let's look to the west. A second dam across the Nanaka River would likewise impound the waters in this lesser area. 
These, in turn, would be drained through a three-mile tunnel into the main reservoir. The waters of the entire area would thus be available for hydroelectric use. To put them into service, two 10-mile tunnels would be driven through the western mountain range from the end of Tapsa Lake, and the water dropped 2,600 feet through Pensox within the mountain to the valley of the Camano River. Here, the great powerhouse would be located in the rock, and from here, a transmission line would convey the electrical energy overland to the proposed plant and town site at Kitimat. Based on this general plan, the survey proceeded. But engineers were faced with numerous alternatives, and so every avenue of thought had to be investigated before any conclusions could be drawn. For instance, in the reservoir alone, there were 27 points for investigation. Many of these canceled themselves out on paper, but others required on-the-spot investigation, and field crews spread out all over the vast area. At this time, the focal spot of the survey came to rest on finding a dam site on the Nechaco River. The best location appeared to be this one, about four miles downstream from the Talcos Lake and called the Butte Site. Here camp was established for 40 men. The survey was now getting down to practical proving of drawing board theory. Surveyors went into action first, establishing levels and marking locations for test holes. And then drill crews moved in to test the rock conditions on either side of the river. One crew started work near the water at the foot of the butte. Inside of two days, Corps showed sufficient promise of good foundations to raise hope, but only for the moment. The drill on the south bank told a different story. Drillers sank their diamonds 10, 50, 100 feet, and three weeks later, 170 feet into the earth. But Corps showed nothing but gravel, where was bedrock? So, consulted with field engineers on the characteristics of the site. They agreed that while still a technical possibility, the cost of a dam at that site would be prohibitive. An alternative site must be found. And so, project number one had drawn a costly blank. Nature had won the first round on the Nechaco. Meanwhile, 150 miles to the west, at the end of Douglas Channel, a party of surveyors had invaded the solitude of Kitimat. This inlet is located about 40 miles due south of the town of Paris, which is on the main line of the CNR between Prince Rupert and Edmonton. In this lonely inlet, surveyors of Swan Roads and Wooster Company were now engaged in mapping the area for plant and town site and conducting another survey on the action of the tides and of the river. Weather recording was likewise being done. Working in all kinds of weather, living in rough tents, out of contact with civilization for endless days, surveyors toiled on, spurred by the knowledge that they were pioneering a new industry. Down in Vancouver, the information they supplied was gradually being compiled, and the thought stages of the project were taking more concrete form. This artist's sketch conveys the thoughts that were developing for the future of Kitimat Valley. The plant would likely be located in the Delta area on the deep side of Kitimat Arm, the town site on the elevated ground in the upper valley across the river. Like Arvida, this is intended to be a model town site, the last word in community planning, laid out for an eventual population of 50,000 people. The plant, to be developed in progressive stages, would be located for access to warpage and designed for an eventual output of 1 billion, 100 million pounds of aluminum ingot per year. During this time, a survey had been conducted in the area of Nanica Lake and along the route of the tunnels. The party from there now returned to the outside world with final data. In due course, this found its way to the engineering office. The Nanica site became the subject of many discussions where numerous alternatives were involved. The most favorite arrangement at the time was committed to drawing for the purposes of costing. 
This artist's perspective gives an idea of the location on Manica River. The foundation proved up to be sound, solid rock. Stripped of overburden, it's expected to look something like this and is considered by engineers to be a good location. To facilitate construction, a tunnel 25 feet in diameter would be driven to divert the water of the river and two copper dams would be constructed to provide a dry riverbed for building of the dam itself. This would be of rock-filled and clay core construction and measure 150 feet in height from the riverbed and have a crest length of 800 feet, nearly the length of two city blocks. In addition to this, a spillway was to be blasted into the left bank to provide against flash flooding and to supply rock for the dam. When completed, the dam would impound 400,000 acre feet of usable water to be drawn off at the upper end of Nanica Lake and discharged through the three mile tunnel down into Tatsa Lake. At this same time, data on the route of the Tatsa Kamano tunnels was taking practical shape on paper. This sketch shows the tunnel route from the Kamano end with some impression of the rugged terrain of the area. Let's cut away the mountain and take a look at the detail. From their portals on Tatsa Lake, 10 miles away, the tunnels would follow a course through solid rock to a point 2,600 feet above the Kamano River, here to connect with Kensock, also tunneled through the rock. From this point, the water would drop to a battery of turbine generators in a powerhouse below. This powerhouse would also be contained in a man-made cavern deep within the mountain rock. From here, the electrical energy would be transmitted up the Kamano Valley and overland to Kitimat. So the survey progressed, and a number of sites in the system were proven up. The plant site, one of the major dam sites, and two tunnels had been investigated, while a number of lesser dikes and dams had likewise been proven to a satisfactory degree. This was indeed encouraging, but when a company is contemplating development in hundreds of millions, no point can be left to chance. There remains still much to be done. Soon the icy hand of winter gripped the Northland, and except for the study of weather and its effect on water conditions, field work had come to an end. But the hydrometric survey was equally important as any phase of the job, and throughout the winter, engineers maintained a constant round of visits to points all over the area. Special equipment had been located at strategic points to measure the river flow beneath the ice. Snow in winter lies frozen on the mountains and water levels drop. It was therefore necessary to determine what the winter runoff would contribute to the reservoir for power production. These delicate instruments were used to automatically record water levels under the ice. In the rivers where ice did not form, another system was used to measure the runoff. Data was gradually accumulated through the constant use of these instruments, and by cross-checking results with government weather reports, some reasonably accurate figures were compiled to justify the assumption that winter, while always a problem, would not prove detrimental to the project. The 1950 survey on the Nechaco River took place at a new site in the canyon, about 11 miles downriver from the old Butte site. By the late spring, the new camp had been established. Surveyors, drill crews, and engineers again took up the challenge of the river, this time doubly determined to find a way to harness its latent power before winter again set in. Surveyors who had toiled themselves to a standstill at the old Butte site now took their sights and drove their stakes with determination into the new soil. It had been decided in previous study that a dam across the narrowest part of the gorge would be best located for final results, and surveys were carried out accordingly.
Meanwhile, down the 75-mile waterway from Utsa Landing, drilling equipment began to arrive. There was little in the way of formal greeting. By this time, the long run had become daily routine. Unloading got underway almost before the boat touched shore. After the drill had been assembled and mounted on skids, yarding it three miles into the canyon was in itself no small job, even for these experienced men of the Boyle Brothers Company. Up to this time, the survey had been concentrated on the south side of the river, but now surveyors had to cross to the north. This was still another challenge to the experience of B.C. Bushmen. And as this need for ingenuity came, they were prepared. The canyon had to be crossed to conduct a survey. They would do it. And here was their answer. Not what you'd call a joyride, but safe enough if you have the self-confidence and strength to get yourself across. Close on the heels of surveyors, drilling got underway. Men who spend their lives pushing holes into the earth get to be fatalists in a way, for nature plays funny tricks. A drill may go through solid rock for 50 feet and then strike nothing but clay for the next hundred. The only proof of what lies beneath is what comes out with the drill. However, engineers in examining the cores of first holes were satisfied. And later drilling continued across the site throughout the summer added up to a foundation of solid rock, an ideal dam site. By late summer of 1950, the field survey of the Nechaco Canyon had been completed. This sketch, developed from engineering drawings, illustrates the general plan for the dam. First, a tunnel, 25 feet in diameter, will be sunk through the rock around the canyon area, and a coffer dam, built just below the portal, will divert the flow of the river through the tunnel, making the canyon accessible for construction of the dam itself. This would be a rock-filled dam with clay core seals and would measure 280 feet in height and 1,800 feet long. In anticipation of its completion, the diversion tunnel would be blocked before the water rose, allowing the water to flood the valleys above. It is estimated but with usage, the reservoir will require a period of four years to fill to maximum elevation. While much of the transportation into the lakes was carried on by plane, heavy equipment was hauled in by road from Burns Lake on the CNR and down to Utsa Landing. Utsa Landing is the access point into the lake area and one of three small adjacent communities along Utsa Lakeshore, the other two being Wisteria and Marilla. Early in the survey, Alcan engineers realized with concern that parts of these communities were in the flood area and that some of the friendly people would in time be obliged to leave their homestead if, as and when, flooding should take place. In Alcan offices, an intensive study has since been conducted. Relief maps have been made to determine the effects of flooding. The waters of Utsa Lake are expected to rise about 140 feet but development of the project would in any event require two or three years to reach a stage where inundation would affect the settlers. In the meantime, it may be expected that a full and satisfactory relocation of these people would take place. In time, the attention of engineers turned to the transmission line, the vital link of shining aluminum cable that would convey the tremendous power from the generators to the site of the plant at Kitimat. Engineers flying over the area viewed with some apprehension the forbidding barrier. Fifty miles of rocky, mountainous, snow-clad wilderness. The big question was not could they build the line, but rather could any line be built to withstand the rigors of the elements, rock slides, ice, snow, and sub-zero temperatures. In engineering offices, data was assembled and studied intently. But figures on weather and topography produced nothing but a big question mark. Discussions all led to one conclusion. They would have to erect towers and string cable to make an on-the-spot test. 
Late in 1950, a chartered cruiser anchored at Kildalla Arm near Kitimat. The tower members, prepared in Vancouver, were about to be carried into the mountain wilderness, there to be erected on the 5,000-foot summit and left to withstand the long, dark winter. A crew of weather observers were likewise giving up the comforts of civilization to spend the winter in snowbound cabins. Before them in the distance lay their objectives, the forbidding barrier across the treacherous route of the power line. In a lonely tidewater camp, men had been observing Keep ahead of bad weather, haste was imperative, and trip after trip was made without a pause until men and equipment had been safely carried to the site. And here they were, 5,000 feet above the sea. Looking from the summit, one could see the rugged route to Kamano Bay. Up this route, three surveyors were now heading, examining the line on foot. For the men on the summit, the good weather held. The test towers began to take shape. But there was no telling when a squall would develop, and an open mountaintop is no place to weather out a storm. Anchor bolts had to be grouted deep into the rock. There was little time for conversation, but no doubt some views were exchanged as to when the transmission line crew would reach the summit. And on the third day they arrived, crossing the glacier higher up to avoid quick disaster in a slide to the valley below. 25 miles of grueling climb lay behind them, and now they faced the descent. Another 25 miles of still tougher country, crevassed by streams from the ice, blocked by cliffs and barriers of broken rock. What lay in the deep shadows of the Kamano, they were determined to find out so that a power line could be built. But for the men on the structure, there was no time for visiting. A cloud condition might develop and remain for weeks. Flying out would be impossible. And these men had no wish to cover the same ground as the survey crew. Five days after arrival, both towers were erected and the short test cable sprung. Only a few hours more of adjusting and testing and the delicate instruments could be installed. Instruments that would automatically record the winter ice loading on the cable. This would provide the vital data needed by engineers in working out wind pressures, spacing of spans, and 101 other contingencies in the designing of a permanent power line. The next day, these instruments arrived, and two days later were installed, ready for their long winter service. After seven days of eating their own cooking and shivering through the glacial night, engineers were glad to board their aluminum dragonfly and turn over the desolation of the mountaintop once again to nature. Late in November of 1950, Mr. McNeely Dubose, Vice President of the Aluminum Company of Canada, visited Mr. Kenny in Victoria. From time to time, progress information on the survey had been forwarded to the Minister of Lands, but until now, no definite statement had been made by the company because of uncertainties still existing in the field. At the time of this meeting, however, Mr. Dubose was pleased to announce that a review of field data proved beyond doubt that the production of aluminum in British Columbia was an economic possibility. Negotiations were resumed, and on January 2nd, 1951, papers carried the news that the minister had signed an agreement granting the aluminum company permission to go ahead and develop the Nechako Kitimat area. To the man on the street, this may have signified immediate action by the company to start spending hundreds of millions of dollars in development. But businesses spending hundreds of millions do so with caution. From the driving of its first survey stake, the industry in Quebec took 30 years of cautious, progressive endeavor to reach its present world position in the production of aluminum. Based on this experience, the development in British Columbia has been planned to take place in three progressive stages governed by growing requirements for the product. Vital defense programs may, however, require full development of the area immediately. Against this possibility, the company is spending large sums of money, and now in early months of 51, is building access roads into the Kamano Valley 
and freighting quantities of equipment and supplies into the Nechaco and other parts of the area. As the needs for aluminum develop, Altan is bending every effort to be rent with a British Columbia product, a product that requires nothing to land but the power of wasting water. Soon now, these rampant forces of the Northland may meet their destiny in final service and time. A service that will mean larger payrolls and still greater prosperity for the pioneer people of British Columbia.